It's been more than four decades since they first hit the charts, and they've been doing their thing ever since. While never achieving supergroup status, Atlantic Star was one of the most consistently successful and underrated soul bands of the 80s and early 90s, with a collection of memorable songs that still sound good today. The band came together in Greenberg, New York, roughly 20 miles north of Manhattan, where the Lewis Brothers grew up. The Lewis Brothers, percussion and trombone player Jonathan, Wayne on keyboard and vocals, and David on guitar and vocals, lost their father at a young age, leaving their mother to raise all seven of them on her own. The boys honed their singing skills and brought the house down at the same time in church. By the time they got to high school, drummer Porter Carroll Jr. was already playing and singing in a band. He persuaded friends Clifford, Cliff Archer, bassist, William Bill Sutter III, trumpeter, Joseph Joe Phillips, percussionist and flutist, Keith Johnson, and Jonathan Lewis to put together their own band. They modeled themselves after funk bands The Barkays and Cool in the Gang. They started performing around the city under the name New Band and later released two albums on the Guinness label. In 1975, they got offered a gig to play in Los Angeles at a party for the Spinners' 20th anniversary. By that time, Porter's cousin, Sharon Bryant, had joined the band as a singer. Prior to their first recordings, three other people in the mix left, Keith Johnson, Duke Jones, and Sheldon Tucker, and one member was added, saxophonist Damon Renty. The now nine-member band ended up turning the trip into a permanent situation when they decided to remain in the city to try to secure a record deal. Until then, they played all the gigs they could find, from Westwood to Riverside to Orange County. Eventually, they set up a showcase at A&M Records. In attendance that night was the A in A&M, co-founder Herb Alpert. He liked what he heard so much that he immediately offered them a recording contract. There was a catch though, they had to change their name. One of their ideas had the word Atlantic in it. They wanted to keep that part since it fit perfectly with them being from the East Coast. They added Star and were on their way. Under the guidance of Philadelphia guitarist, songwriter, and producer Bobby Eli, the group's self-titled debut album dropped in 1978. It included their debut single, Stand Up, a funk anthem that made it into the top 20 on the R&B chart. While that wasn't a bad start, their label decided to steer them in a different direction after their follow-up album, 1979 Straight to the Point, put up disappointing numbers. A&M felt that they could do better and decided it was time to change the group's producer. For their next attempt, 1981's Radiant, James Anthony Carmichael was brought on board and Sharon was put front and center in more ways than one. Her standout performance on the lead single, When Love Calls, sent it all the way to number five on the R&B chart. The album also peaked at the number five position on the top R&B hip hop albums chart. For years, that was how things went for Atlantic Star. Most of their singles made the R&B chart, but none of them went pop. That finally changed with their next effort. The band's fourth album, titled Brilliance, was released in 1982. The lead single, a dance track called Circles, would give the group the most chart success they'd ever had, going all the way to number two on the R&B chart and finally making it into the top 40 on the Billboard Hot 100 by coming in at a respectable number 38. The track was also responsible for driving the album to number one on the top R&B hip hop albums chart. By the time their next album, 1983's Yours Forever dropped, brothers Wayne and David had solidified their position as the group's primary songwriters. Along with the help of their producer, they were encouraged and taught to write material that would stand the test of time. While this was, no doubt, a great accomplishment for them, the other members had begun to feel a way about how it changed the duo. For lack of a better word, their success had made them go Hollywood. Naturally, with writing credits to their name, their share of the money was now far more than anyone else. In their 2012 Unsung episode, Sharon was brought to tears, speaking about being put in the middle of all the animosity. To make matters worse, some members started to suspect that their money was actually being mishandled by their management. Then it all came to a head. In the midst of working on their next album, the group split in two camps. One side included Porter, Sharon, Bill, Cliff, and saxophonist Coran Daniels, who replaced Damon. On the other, the three Lewis brothers and Joe. In a 1986 interview with the Los Angeles Times, Wayne explained, everybody wanted to do what David and I were doing. 
We're the main writers and we work hand in hand with the producers. All of a sudden, everybody had their own ideas about concepts and directions. There was a tug of war in all directions. Things got taken to yet another level when the first five members decided to halt their work altogether until they were able to sort out their management issues. However, their contract stated that they needed two thirds majority to make any such changes. Since there were only five members on strike, they all opted to leave the group entirely. James Anthony Carmichael, fed up with the infighting, also called it quits. And just like that, Atlantic Star was now a foursome, with the Lewis brothers in full control. While the Yours Forever album didn't produce great results, it still managed to squeeze out a top five R&B song with Touch a Four Leaf Clover. The remaining members needed to go back to the drawing board, since Sharon leaving created a hole in their sound and style. Enter Barbara Weathers. She was a 21-year-old singer from North Carolina whom Wayne and David had been developing as a solo artist. They decided to offer her the lead vocalist job, and she took it. As the band turns, Atlantic Star's sixth album was released in 1985. They not only showed off their new look, but a new sound, with the lead track, Freakeristic, which made it into the top 10 on the R&B chart. Sadly, this wasn't impressive enough for the label. After six albums, they were getting frustrated with the band's inability to achieve wider success. So in the middle of a 1986 tour, A&M dropped them from their roster. In a crazy twist of fate though, the song that would change everything had started to get some buzz. On the suggestion from the drummer from funk band Confunction that they were touring with, the group decided to move the song called Secret Lovers from the middle of their set to the very end and close with it. The results created magic. As the tour went on, the song continued to gather steam, which was quite a feat. First of all, the album had already been out for nearly a year. It's rare for a single from such an old album to become a hit. Even more surprising is that Secret Lovers is a ballad, when they'd been previously known for mainly their up-tempo work. Fun fact, the song had been released as a single the year before, but since the label wasn't interested in putting any promotion behind it, Atlantic Star had to put together their own music video. Hence why it has such a homemade look to it. Secret Lovers exploded on the charts, becoming a top five hit on both the R&B and pop charts. The group's last record for a and also became their first gold record. Not surprisingly, the label now wanted to re-sign them, but the group was in high demand now and had a plethora of offers to choose from. They ultimately went with Warner Brothers. Fun fact, the band was signed by their R&B exec and former Motown a and Benny Medina. He would also be the one to convince them that the lead single off their next album should be one particular song, one that would ultimately take them to the top of the pop chart. Their first project for Warner Brothers, 1987's All In The Name Of Love, would not only go platinum, but also give Atlantic Star their first, and to date only, number one R&B and number one pop hit with Always. The track was actually written five years prior, around when the band was working on their 1982 album, but their producer didn't think it was the right time to feature it on the project and told them to just hold on to it. For Barbara, the lyrics really hit home since she and Wayne were in a long-term relationship. Unfortunately, his brothers weren't thrilled about it. Barbara felt the tension especially from her singing partner, David. One night, things escalated between the two backstage in her dressing room when she confronted him about how he was treating her. A screaming match ensued. She had an issue with management as well. She told Unsung that she gave their manager power of attorney when she signed her contract, and one day, he informed her that she didn't have any money in her account, which was news to her since the band had just come off a two-year tour. So she took matters into her own hands by hiring an accountant. After the numbers were crunched though, she had no choice but to accept the harsh reality that she was indeed broke. She confronted the guys about it, but they didn't believe her. That was the last straw. So at the height of Atlantic Star's career, Barbara walked away. After she left, the band also cut ties with their longtime manager, Earl Cole. The way Barbara tells it, the other members actually fired him for standing up for her. Atlantic Star forged ahead with yet another new female vocalist, Portia Martin, but they took a different approach with her. She was relegated to more of a backup position so the guys could stand out as lead vocalists. They did just that on their next project, 1989's We're Moving Up, with Wayne in the spotlight on the lead single, My First Love. However, even though the song hit number one on the R&B chart, it didn't touch the Hot 100 at all. Overall, the album pretty much flopped. In 1990, after another tour that he called terrible, Joe decided it was time to move on and left the band. 
By the time Atlantic Star's next album dropped, they'd gone through yet another change. 1991's Love Crazy featured a new female vocalist, Rachel Oliver. The album produced two standout songs, the title track, which came in at number seven on the R&B chart, and Masterpiece, their biggest hit since always. It captured the number three position on both the R&B and pop charts and went gold. Warner Brothers still dumped them though. The band moved on and signed with Arista, where they would release their final major label project with 1994's Time. It only produced lackluster results. It also served as Atlantic Star's last album with David. His life was moving in a different direction. He was married now, and he and his wife had grown closer to God, forcing David to accept that what he was doing with the band was not in alignment with his faith. As if you weren't tired of the constant member changes already, here's some more. Atlantic Star released two more albums to wrap up the 90s, 1998's All Because of You and 1999's Legacy. All Because of You featured Aisha Tanner, the group's fifth female singer, who came on the scene to replace Rachel. When Legacy came out, the group unveiled yet another lineup, one that consisted of Rachel, who had returned to replace Aisha, and a new male singer named Dwayne Woods. The band's latest album, Metamorphosis, was released in 2017. It features new members, singers LeJohn Epps and Melissa Pierce. Atlantic Star are still touring and performing today, though Wayne and Jonathan Lewis are the only original members still with the group. The quartet also includes Melissa Pierce and new member Shema Carter. 